How many people here have tried Pandora, just so I have an idea? Okay. Um, so my name is Tim Westergren. Um, I'm a musician. Um, and I thought I would tell you a little bit about the sort of origin of what has come to be called Pandora. Um, so I, I spent about 10 years after college playing in uh, rock bands, uh, trying to be a rock star. Um, came very close. Um, I lived out of a van and traveled around the US and, and played in all sorts of random locations. And uh, <coughs> over the course of those years, became really familiar with the challenges that face uh, independent musicians. So there are thousands and thousands of them out there plowing the interstates, um, trying to build a career. Um, but the music industry, the nature of the music industry is such that it really only has room right, right now for a small number of uh, artists to create careers. Um, there's a very small window through which musicians can kind of be seen by a big audience. And uh, as a musician, I saw a lot of, a lot of other artists, bands, and, and soloists who I thought had a tremendous amount of potential to become successful musicians, um, but very few of whom I think are still active musicians. Um, so I became very interested in figuring out how to solve the problem of connecting a musician to their audience. Um, I also spent about uh, four years as a film composer. And as a film composer, my job was essentially to figure out the musical taste of a film director. And that process was typically took the form of you know, sitting down and having that film director um, share with me songs that they liked or artists that they liked, or, or even scores that they liked. Sometimes they'd actually bring a finished picture and have, it, uh, have music on, the, on the, the film already. Basically music that was far too expensive for them to, to make and they wanted me to do it cheaper. Um, and so I had to kind of take this input from them, go back to my recording studio, and create a new composition that would sort of mirror what they had told me. Um, they weren't typically musicians, so that, that, didn't, that information did not come in the form of kind of musicological feedback. So um, not things like you know, the kind of instrumentation they liked, or melodic or harmonic qualities, or so on. So I started developing this, this um, internal sort of musical genome in my head. Um, I think we all do that a little bit informally, whether we're, we're musicians or not. Um, trying, you know, when you recommend a record to a friend, more often than not, I think, you base that on some kind of musical connection to another record that, that they like. Um, and I was doing that pretty formally as, an, as a composer, because you had to sit down and really kind of you know, decide what instruments are going to go into the piece, what's it going to sound like, all the little details of it. Um, so I had been in the habit of doing that. And, and um, I was living in San Francisco in, in 1999, which was an insane place to, to be at the time. Um, we were, the, the, the dot com boom was cresting. And, I had an idea, which was, what if I could kind of take this genome in my head and actually uh, put it down on paper and create some kind of an interface using the web that would allow someone to have something of the same conversation that I was having with a film director only over the internet. So you could type in a song you liked. Um, some, there would be some mechanism to sort of understand that song or artist's genome and we could then sort of start comparing that to other songs and make suggestions to you um, of other songs you might like. So, following so far? Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, I sat down uh, in the beginning of 2000 um, with a couple friends, and I actually created a, what, what has come to call the Music Genome Project, which is essentially an enormous musical taxonomy. Um, it's a list now of about 400. Uh, unique musical attributes that kind of collectively describe a piece of music. So you know, music is composed of many things, M melody and harmony and rhythm and form and instrumentation. And now you have 400, but does that mean you'd rather have 1,000 and you only have 400 now? Uh, yeah, it could be 10 times the size. But the, is it better if it's bigger? Yes, but it takes more time to do the musical analysis. So. Um, we actually started at, at a larger number, um, but wound up with about 400. So, so these are essentially all the little details of melody and harmony and rhythm and these, these various aspects. The idea being that we're kind of trying to capture the primary colors of each one of those aspects of music. So as an example, the voice, we described along over 30 attributes for the voice alone. So the, the range, the, the use of vibrato, 
uh, falsetto, uh, the timbre of the voice. So, you know, is it gravelly? Is it, is it breathy? Uh, is it thick or thin? All these different things. The idea being that whether you were Tom Waits or Ella Fitzgerald, we could describe your voice uh, along the same set of attributes, just sort of different levels of each one. And so we created this genome, and, and, um, uh, and then it, one of my co-founders was a computer scientist and mathematician, and we kind of really through a, a process of ideation, um, you know, some, a whiteboard, some pen, pizza, and some, you know, recreational drugs. And, you know, we, we started sort of uh, kind of figuring out how to, how to take this and turn it into a piece of software. And eventually kind of landed on this idea of sort of a, a 400 dimensional universe of stars. Uh, every song being a star in this, in this big uh, universe and, and, and being able to calculate kind of musical proximity. Um, and we, we launched the genome and we, start, we hired some musicians whom we trained very uh, extensively, trained musicians. Um, and they sat down and started analyzing songs one at a time and measuring them along each one of these attributes. So it can take upwards of 30 minutes to do a single song. And we've been doing it for seven years now. Um, we have over half a million songs in this music genome project now. And uh, what it's sort of allowed us to do is um, enable someone with just one starting point, just a song that they like, type it into what has now become an online radio system, and generate a radio station that plays songs based on musical similarity. So it's kind of like a one-click radio. And what it's meant to solve is sort of two big problems. One problem is the one I started with, which is how does a musician find an audience? So this is a technology that, because it's connecting songs based on musical similarity, doesn't depend at all on an artist's popularity. It recommends music based on its proximity from a musical standpoint. So it's, it's, an, it's an, the ideal way of sort of plucking out, or rather exposing potentially a huge range of uh, artists to a broad audience, whether they're you know, well known or not. The other side of the same coin is uh, people who love music, but who as they've gotten older in particular, have become sort of disconnected from it. So I, I, I'm looking at the, the, the age of this audience, I suspect that which is very young and vibrant, um, uh, is, is my guess is probably a lot of you have the same experience with music where, you know, you're not buying CDs all that much anymore. Maybe you've bought the latest Rolling Stones record or, you know, the, the sort of the, uh, the reissue of the band that you knew as a kid. Um, but your sort of music listening habits have sort of atrophied. And uh, it's not that you don't love music, but you just don't have the time anymore to find something that you like. And we wanted to solve that problem. So, we, we, we built the software. We raised a, a little bit of money in, in March of 2000. We actually raised the money about three weeks before, you know, the shit hit the fan in, in Silicon Valley, and everything kind of went to hell in a handbasket. You know, the, the, the stock market collapsed. The, the Silicon Valley uh, investment doors closed shut. I can relate to the uh, in, in challenges of raising VC money. I pitched this company probably 300 times over a two-year period. Um, we actually ran out of money after about a year and, and didn't take salaries for two years. Um, but managed to sort of somehow survive and, and all along continue to build this collection of songs kind of one at a time. And wound up in March of 2004 able to raise a, a more significant amount of money and, and eventually launch a radio service, and, and which we called Pandora. Um, it was launched about 10 months ago, and, and uh, just two days ago we crossed a three and a half million registered listener uh, threshold without advertising the service at all. And, and I think that that's sort of a, a symptom of, of um, you know, how broken the music, uh, music world is right now, where there's, I think, a hunger among people to, to find new music, but no easy way to do it. You know, how many of us have spent in the last 10 years two hours in a record store browsing through bins? Um, how many of us are happy with the selection of radio stations in Providence, Rhode Island, or wherever you live? Um, and so people have become disconnected from it, but now the idea is with this new service, which right for right now is, is available only online, um, can provide you with sort of an instant uh, um, sort of personalized radio station. You can create 100 radio stations um, that will sort of uh, retain their, the feedback you give them. And the sort of next step uh, in this process is once we've 
create a station that, that sort of bears musical similarity to your starting points, you can start to um, react to the music you're hearing. So you can give a song a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Um, and when you do that, it's a little bit like, you know, going back to that, the idea of that conversation, the director saying, no, no, I don't like that or I do like that one. And then the Music Genome Project, which is meant to kind of represent the knowledgeable musician or knowledgeable owner of the small record store, that dying breed. Actually, independent record stores are remarkably healthy these days. Um, and they can kind of uh, take that as musical input and then further adapt the recommendations that they give you. So what happens sort of mathematically is if you imagine each song is represented by this long list, this huge list of numbers that represent all these attributes. Um, we, uh, we calculate through a heinous Pythagorean equation the uh, aggregate distance between these, uh, each song based on these numbers. And each one of those genes, we call them genes, these musical attributes, has a weight. So tempo is more important than the amount of chromatic harmony in the alto sax solo. We capture both of those things, but they have a different weight. As How you, do you weight them? Well, we, we did that by trial and error. So collectively, those 400 attributes account for 100% of that song's personality. And we divvied up this, that 100% of weight across all these genes one by one. As you give the, this uh, system feedback, what essentially happens is that the importance of the genes start to change. So let's say you have thumbs up six songs in a row that have, to, to use something simple, have a female vocalist. And the one song that comes up with a male vocalist, you give it a thumbs down. The system will say, OK, I think that we're onto something here. Let's play, let's start playing less male vocalists. They really, when they said they liked Cheryl Crow, they, one of the things they were really telling us was they liked a female vocalist on this station. So it becomes a way of kind of personalizing uh, really quickly and easily your station, but also not in some generic way. You know, really being able to adapt to your particular musical preferences. And, and I think one of the sort of fatal flaws of um, what you might call collaborative filtering engines, which is, you know, people who bought this also bought this, um, is that people like music for very different reasons. And the idea behind the genome is to try and really respect that you may both like the song, we may both like Bonnie Raitt, um, but maybe I like it because I'm a fan of the blues and you like it because you like s sappy love songs. I'm just trying to get back at you. That was a compliment. Uh, um, and we want to be able to distinguish those things so we can recommend different songs and that you can shape your, your listening experience based on your particular preferences. Um, so we, we, we've, we've launched a service. We're, we're um, just shy of a year into it. And, and, and sort of one other thing I'll share a little bit with you is um, uh, I've been traveling around the US um, holding uh, what we've come to call town hall meetings, which are um, much like this, actually, uh, with uh, audiences of Pandora listeners. And I'm actually having, holding one tonight in Providence, um, where we invite people who are in this area. We, we actually know their zip codes, because they register with us, and they give us a zip code. We invite them to sort of a get together for an informal conversation about you know, Pandora, but also online music in general, and the, the future of, of digital music. And, um, it has been a very, it's, it's been almost like a spiritual experience to, and I'm, you know, an atheist, so uh, I, 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 um, have, I have felt these meeting, in these meetings this extraordinary kind of um, energy and enthusiasm around music and, and, and in a sort of sense of commonality uh, when you get a group of people in a room. And these, I did one at MIT yesterday and there were 220 people in this uh, enormous lecture hall. And they come from all walks of life. There are you know, older professors. There are 18-year-old freshmen in college, uh, working people, and musicians. And, and when we're all together in this room talking about music, there's this real sense of there's a very common language. Um, and we have an enormous amount of communication that happens also by email. Um, I, I, I send and receive hundreds of emails a day from people. Um, and, uh, the, the sort of experience of being in, in now in a large consumer-facing service and having direct uh, contact with so many folks um, has really been extraordinary and, and gives me a lot of, um, I'm very optimistic about not only what I think um, 
we can do for music, but what I think music can, can pot potentially do more broadly in society. I think, that, um, I think that one of the things that really is missing in America right now is music. Uh, it's over the years, um, because of the nature of the economics of the music business, it's become kind of less and less a part of our cultural fabric. And, you know, music has always been, uh, to referring back to our speaker, our earlier, uh, uh, the, the moderator, um, a catalyst for um, a lot of good things in society. And I'm hoping that by sort of uh, giving folks, reconnecting people with music um, over time, that, that we can sort of reintroduce that really healthy ingredient into um, sort of our, our culture. Uh, and it's been a, a really wonderful experience. We're now focused on uh, trying to find a way to make Pandora mobile so you can listen to it from some kind of device. Uh, we're, we're eagerly awaiting um, mobile um, sort of municip municipal Wi-Fi so you can listen to this on a little uh, wireless enabled device. Um, but uh, it's been a wonderful experience and we're up to 100 people now and, and uh, looking forward to the next few years. So. Thank you.